Encrypted Classic Horror with Jasper Lestrange. Tales of horror, mystery, and suspense. <laughs> Christmas Meeting by Rosemary Timberley I have never spent Christmas alone before. It gives me an uncanny feeling, sitting alone in my furnished room, with my head full of ghosts, and the room full of voices of the past. It's a drowning feeling, all the Christmases of the past coming back in a mad jumble. The childish Christmas with a house full of relations, a tree in the window, sixpences in the pudding, and the delicious crinkly stocking in the dark morning. The adolescent Christmas with mother and father, the war and the bitter cold, and the letters from abroad. The first really grown-up Christmas with a lover, the snow and the enchantment, red wine, kisses, and the walk in the dark before midnight, with the ground so white, and the stars diamond bright in a black sky, so many Christmases through the years. And now, the first Christmas alone, but not quite loneliness feeling of companionship with all the other people who are spending Christmas alone, millions of them, past and present, a feeling that if I close my eyes there will be no past or future, only an endless present, which is time, because it is all we ever have. Yes, however cynical you are, however irreligious, it makes you feel queer to be alone Christmas time. So I'm absurdly relieved when the young man walks in. There's nothing romantic about it. I'm a woman of nearly fifty, a spinster schoolmarm with grim dark hair and myopic eyes that were once beautiful. And he's a kid of twenty, rather unconventionally dressed with a flowing wine-coloured tie and black velvet jacket and brown curls which could do with the taste of the barber's scissors. The effeminacy of his dress is belied by his features, narrow, piercing blue eyes, and arrogant jutting nose and chin. Not that he looks strong. The skin is fine drawn over the prominent features, and he is very white. He bursts in without knocking, then pauses, says, I'm so sorry. I thought this was my room. He begins to go out, then hesitates, and says, Are you alone? Yes. It's queer being alone at Christmas, isn't it? May I stay and talk? I'd be glad if you would. He comes right in and sits down by the fire. I hope you don't think I came in here on purpose. I really did think it was my room he explains. I am glad you made the mistake, but sure a very young person to be alone at Christmas time. I wouldn't go back to the country to my family. It would hold up my work. I'm a writer. I see. I can't help smiling a little. That explains his rather unusual dress. And he takes himself so seriously, this young man. Of course, you mustn't waste a precious moment of writing, I say, with a twinkle. No, not a moment. That's what my family won't see. They don't appreciate urgency. Families are never appreciative of the artistic nature. No, they aren't, he agrees, seriously. What are you writing? Poetry and a diary combined. It's called My Poems and I by Francis Randall. That's my name. My family says there's no point in my writing. That I'm too young. But I don't feel young. Sometimes I feel like an old man, with too much to do before he dies. 
revolving faster and faster on the wheel of creativeness. Yes, yes, exactly. You understand. You must read my work sometime. Please read my work. Read my work. A note of desperation in his voice, a look of fear in his eyes, makes me say, We're both getting much too solemn for Christmas Day. I'm going to make you some coffee. And I have a plum cake. I move about, clattering cups, spooning coffee into my percolator. But I must have offended him, for when I look round, I find he has left me. I am absurdly disappointed. I finish making coffee, however, then turn to the bookshelf in the room. It is piled high with volumes for which the landlady has apologised profusely. Hope you don't mind the books, miss, but my husband won't part with them, and there's nowhere else to put them. We charge a bit less for the room for that reason. I don't mind, I said. Books are good friends, but these aren't very friendly-looking books. I take one at random. Or does some strange fate guide my hand? Sipping my coffee, I begin to read the battered little book, published, I see, in spring 1852. It's mainly poetry, immature stuff, but vivid. Then there's a kind of diary, more realistic, less affected. Out of curiosity, to see if there are any amusing comparisons, I turn to the entry for Christmas Day, 1851. I read, My first Christmas Day alone. I had rather an odd experience. When I went back to my lodgings after a walk, there was a middle-aged woman in my room. I thought at first I'd walked into the wrong room, but this was not so, and later, after a pleasant talk, she disappeared. I suppose she was a ghost, but I wasn't frightened. I liked her, but I do not feel well tonight, not at all well. I have never felt ill at Christmas before. A publisher's note followed the last entry. Francis Randall died from a sudden heart attack on the night of Christmas Day, 1851. The woman mentioned in this final entry in his diary was the last person to see him alive. In spite of requests for her to come forward, she never did so. Her identity remains a mystery. The Stocking by Nigel Neal On the day before Christmas, the sun came through the window so low that it lit the highest broken patch on the wall. It was very cold when Ma came home, and she put an extra cover on his cot, the cover from their bed with the paper stuffing. A corner of paper stuck out with a picture of a lady on it. She gave him a piece of bread and fat while she made the tea. Ma, he said. Ma looked hard and said, Yes? Will you hang up a stocking for me tonight? Ma laughed and said, All right. I got a big bag of sweets in it last year. He said, Daddy Christmas is kind, isn't he, Ma? Ma laughed again, and afterwards he heard her counting the money in her purse. Maybe Daddy Christmas will come, maybe he won't she said. But Pa will hang a stocking up for you. When Pa had finished his soup in the evening, he brought a chair and fastened an old one of Ma's long stockings to the wooden beam that ran across the room above the cot, a little below the ceiling. Pa leaned on the cot as he stepped down, and it creaked and swayed. That'll never do, said Pa and he knocked four nails into the cot to hold it more firmly to the wall. It had no legs. Plaster crumbled into his eyes as Pa hammered, and Pa leaned into the cot and rubbed away some of the grit with his sleeve. Ma said, 
Turn over, silly creature. He pulled himself onto his face until the hammering was over. That'll keep it fast, said Pa, and his mouth twitched at Ma as he jerked his head at the places where the Minkies lived. Ma nodded, and she said in the little voice he was not meant to hear, He doesn't mind the rats. Loudly, she said, You don't mind the Mickey Mouse's love. You're too big to be afraid of them. He smiled at Ma, though the plaster was still hurting his eyes. She meant the Minkies. They lived high up, and they had fur on their bodies and long tails. And when the dark came and Ma and Pa went to bed, the Minkies ran about inside the ceiling. Sometimes they scratched on the floor below the cot. But when it was light, they never came. There's plenty of room in that stocking, said Pa, and he laughed. Ma laughed too, and then she said to Pa, Come in now? And Pa said, Yes, the usual. Ma counted her money again and smiled. We can celebrate tonight. He left the house to himself, said Pa. Why aren't there any other people now? He asked from the cot. Pa laughed. I thought there were too many Mickey Mouses. Oh, it'll be closing time before you come, Ma shouted. When they had gone, everything was still, only the candle flickering softly. He looked up at the stocking, hanging straight from the beam. It might have a bulge in it by morning. He sang to himself in the cot, faintly, a little song that turned out to be about the Minkies, their strange ways, their quietness, and their scuttling walk. He listened to the noise of ships on the distant river and wondered why his legs would not move, although he was five. He wondered about Christmas and why it was not in the summer. He wondered about many things and shivered and tried to screw himself up. There was a tiny sound in the ceiling, a faint scraping noise, as if somebody very small was shifting their feet. That would be a minky. There came another little sound, and another, and presently a soft slither, as if something had jumped onto the beam above. The minkies were coming out. He looked up towards the dark ceiling and saw the green glimmer of two tiny eyes, and then two more, and then others. The ceiling was full of rustling and scuttling, as it always was when the house became still. Minkies didn't like you to see them. A loose nail tumbled from above and clattered on the floor. He saw that the whole wide beam was bulging on each side, and that the bulges were moving and changing. Often, a long tail twitched and curled. Everywhere was a scratching, and the little squeaky sound of Minky's talk, like the talk of the yellow bird that died, only quicker and sharper. Suddenly, it stopped. He looked upwards again, and the flickering eyes peeped down from the beam. He saw that the long Daddy Christmas stocking was moving, swaying from side to side, jerking. It seemed to have thickened at the place Pa had tied it to the beam. Then it had thickened lower down and lower. And there was a minky clinging to the stocking and slowly dropping. Its eyes twinkled as it swung and its head shot this way and that. He could smell the dark smell of the minky very close. When the furry body had reached the end of the stocking, it hung, curled upside down, and its tail twisted here and there, feeling the folds in the stocking. He started with the quickness of the minky's jump, for all at once the stocking was tossing empty, and the minky crouched on the foot of the cot, watching him. But when he looked back at the stocking, there were three more minkies climbing down, swinging like the first one, yet there was no noise at all. 
the minkies jumped onto the edge of the cot, one by one, and others took their place at the top of the stocking. They climbed down quickly, and many more bodies bobbed along the beam above. The first minky crouched and jumped into the cot. He could feel its weight, gently pressing the bedclothes down, and at the same time there was a small, cold feeling inside his head. But he was not afraid of furry minkies. He held out his hand gently towards the first one. It did not move. Then suddenly there was a little sharp pain in his finger, and he pulled it back. The minky stared at him with black, round eyes, like the end of Mars' hatpin. There was a tiny red bead on his finger that was salt when he tasted it. And everywhere was full of minkies, strange with the smell and warmth of them. All the whiskers and eyes and pointed faces moved together. They went, now, 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 like the bumping of the heart inside his chest. There was a gentle weight on him. He looked down. The first minky sat on his chest, watching his eyes with its own. His hands were as log-heavy as his legs. He saw its mouth open, narrow and sharp and pale. It gave one shrill cry of minky talk, and instantly the whole room turned to hot, leaping fur, squealing and tearing and chattering and biting. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.